today. Thank you very much for having me. I'm Jane Ramsey, a board member here at CAN-TV. This is a live interactive program brought to you as a community service by CAN-TV. Um, we welcome your questions and comments. Please call us at 312-738-1060. And during the next 25 minutes, we're going to get to as many of your questions as we can. So the, um, this evening, Representative Martwick, you have many issues that uh, brought you to uh, run and now become a state representative. Uh, many of those are uh, fiscally related. Um, one big issue in the state uh, is pension reform. Um, can you tell us where you think we are on that and why there's been so much struggle and what is the future? Well, I, I think that uh, the most important thing to note about the pension issue is that um, there's, I think there's been a great disservice that's been done, and that's been to take the pension issue and simplify it into the analogy I was use is that it's been simplified by, uh, by some people into sort of a light switch, yeah. on or off, yes or no, you're for it or you're against it, and and that's not it at all. In fact, the way that I typically describe it is a mixing board at a at a studio. There's a million switches and knobs and buttons and dials and levers and gauges, and all of those have to be put just right in order for the plan to work. As evidence of that, any time that we propose a pension bill that's going to change pension benefits, the the, the actuary analysis takes two full weeks. Mm -hmm. And this is not a part-time thing. This is a, a contract actuarial firm working full-time on the bill. So it's an enormously complicated problem, but I, I think it's wrong to characterize that, that the legislature doesn't have uh, the stomach to address it. We are addressing it. It's just that with 177 elected officials, there are very marketedly different opinions on the right solution to the problem. Now, you, you actually have come out for a particular plans. Um, why, um, and I think one of the plans that you backed was uh, put forward by um, Representative Cullerton. And so why that plan? Well, that was, another? yeah, Senate President Cullerton's uh, SB 2404. I supported that. Uh, for a couple of basic reasons. Um, number one, there are only a few facts that are undeniable in the pension problem, and one of them is that the employees were not the cause of the problem. Um, all of the pension administrators that I met with said that if the government had made its payments into the system as scheduled, there would be no pension problem. Um, and Senate President Cullerton sat down with the employees, met with them, negotiated with them, negotiated concessions that perhaps legally they don't have to make. And to me, that was worth uh, giving them consideration for those concessions. And I thought that we should have honored that. I don't know, and I've told the, uh, the, the people uh, who supported this bill, I don't know that it's the be all and end all. And it may not fix the problem mm -hmm. entirely. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, it would be better to start with that. And if we have to go back, then at least we've negotiated in good faith. So another issue related to that, financial issue, and it's coming up and it's going to be coming up this session, are proposals uh, looking at taxes and tax reform, um, including a uh, consideration of a graduated state income tax. Yes. Um, what's your analysis of that? Where are you on that? Um, can we get a uh, um, tax reform? Can we get a graduate state income tax to, so that we can relieve some of the pressure? Well, I think that a, a graduated state income tax is, is an idea that is certainly uh, worth consideration. And, and from a policy perspective, uh, I support it 100%. I think that it would be a fair tax. Uh, to tax people based on their ability to pay, um, much like we do in the federal government already. And the amazing thing is, uh, of the 41 states who assess an income tax, 37 of them have graduated rates. Illinois is one of only four that uses a flat rate. So I think we definitely should pursue that as part of a, a package where we look at creating um, not just more fairness, but more efficiency in the way that we raise revenues. Great. Thank you. It's refreshing to hear, to be able to have this conversation and 
to have a representative not run away from the word tax. Yeah. Um, and we have a, a caller on the line. Caller, welcome, and uh, please ask your question. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, I read recently that they're going to increase the speed limit in uh, Illinois. Um, my question is twofold. Uh, when is that going to take an uh, effect, and uh, is it going to make the streets safer? Uh, good question. Um, so the the bill that we passed, um, and I voted for it, increased the speed limit from 65 to 75 on interstates in counties, uh, rural counties. So there were certain counties that uh, are exempt from that, Cook County and the, the collar counties that surround Cook, as well as the Metro East area are, are exempted from that. Uh, maximum speed limit increase. So there, in, in the Chicagoland area, we will remain 65. But in rural uh, areas where the congestion is not as bad, the maximum speed limit uh, will raise to 70 on those areas. Um, I'm honestly not sure when it takes effect. It might be January 1st, uh, but I'm not positive. Um, and the counties have to opt into it, so it's uh, it's not a guarantee that it will be everywhere, but it, it does raise the speed limit. In terms of uh, whether or not it makes our streets safer, uh, again, this will only apply to the highways. It, most of the studies show that people are already driving around 70 to 72 miles an hour. Really what this does is this takes those rural areas and makes the the legal speed limit conform with the actual speed that travelers are traveling. Great. Thank you very much, caller. Um, Representative Martwick, um, we we're talking about uh, funding, taxes, pensions, another big hot issue, schools. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe the hottest issue that gets to each of um, our families. What do we, how do we solve the schools issue? Well, um, I have pretty strong opinions on the schools issue. Um, I, I, I'm a strong supporter of teachers, and, and I'm a strong supporter of the profession of teaching. And I feel that um, some of the attempts that we've made to fix the school problem, or the, the education problem in Illinois, has been to attack the teacher, which I, I don't really understand. Um, when I was elected, and it's been a long time since I've been in school, but when I was elected, I did a tour of all the schools in my area. In my area, it encompasses the O'Hare region, which has the highest performing schools in the city. And as I visited these schools, I saw teacher after teacher and administrator after administrator dedicated and, and really caring about what they were trying to accomplish in terms of education. And and I, I, I was fascinated by how much I was impressed by this. The thing that I look at is that the difference between what I have in the northwest side of the city of Chicago and what we might find in North Lawndale or Englewood is not the teachers. It's the same teachers. It's not the curriculum. It's the same curriculum. It's not the administrators. In fact, one could argue that the administrators and the teachers that are working in these troubled areas are, have, a, have an extra level of dedication to what they're trying to do. The difference is socioeconomic. And the only way we're going to really get to the bottom of, of the educational disparities in our city is to understand that it's a socioeconomic problem. Because clearly, the status quo that's not working in those neighborhoods is excelling in mine. We have to find a way to make that equal across the city. Well, it's certainly, we can't begin to solve our state's problems if we have the inequality that we do in terms of resources that are right. available for our schools and, and um, you've touched on um, some of the critical issues um, that we are facing. Um, you're watching Political Forum, a community service of CAN-TV. I'm Jane Ramsey, a board member of CAN-TV. We invite you to call in. This is a live interactive show. Um, you can call in at 312-738-1060. We're um, fortunate to be joined by Representative Martwick. And, uh, it's an opportunity to ask questions. Um, Representative uh, Marwick, we've touched on education, schools, um, taxes. Another hot issue that um, you were supportive of this year is marriage equality. Yes. Uh, where are we there, and are we going to um, get a piece of legislation passed? Uh, 
I believe that we are, and I believe that we are because I believe in uh, my colleague and the bill's chief sponsor, Representative Greg Harris. Um, it was very disappointing for many people that we were unable to get that bill passed uh, before the end of the regular session. But that was, uh, Representative Harris was asked by a number of legislators for additional time to work with their constituents in areas where they felt that the issue was uh, not so clear cut and dry. And so uh, he gave them that time with the idea that we would come back and veto and we would get this passed in veto session in October and November. And I am very, very hopeful that we will. It was an honor to work with him. Um, he assigned me some tough tasks of of whipping other members, uh, trying to uh, take people that were on the fence and convince them of it. And it was something that I was very proud to do. Um, and as a, as a freshman state rep, that was a, that was a pretty um, important responsibility to be, to be given. It, it was it was definitely a challenge, especially given the, the and I won't name any names, but given some of the representatives yeah. that he asked me to talk to, it was a challenge. But it's something that I feel strongly about, and I feel like I have the ability to convince people yeah. of the of, of of the righteousness of it. So, and we have another caller. Welcome, caller. Hi, um, I wanted to ask a question about concealed carry. Something that has bothered me a great deal is, is some people are saying that. If once you're okay to uh, carry a concealed weapon, uh, that you can carry any number of weapons, that it's not limited to a weapon, and that just seems that that's sort of against the grain of the whole idea. Could you clarify that? Am I wrong with my information? Um. The, the so the concealed carry bill is an enormous bill. Um, it was something that we uh, we worked on very hard from the first day we were there until the last day. We, we, I was the last day of the legislature that we finally had a consensus bill. And uh, I, you know, it's a good question. I, I I I think you're right. I don't think that there is a limit to the number of weapons that you can conceal on your person. I don't believe that that was added into uh, the legislation. Um, it's an interesting uh, thing that you bring up, and it's something that um, it, though those sorts of points, typically on a bill like this, we will come back and we will file a number of trailer bills to clean it up. It, such big legislation, as it once it's, it's uh, implemented, we'll find out that there are little things that we need to tweak as we go along. Um, I, I personally am actually pretty proud of the concealed carry overall, not that there aren't some issues with it, but I think that's a, a real example of democracy mm -hmm. because no one liked the bill, which meant that everyone had to concede something to get to this point where we could pass it. We were required to pass it by the courts. It was not an option. Um, and, and one of the things that, that I'm particularly proud of is that uh, there is a part of that bill that has my stamp on it because um, about a month into being elected I held a citizen advisory committee on public safety and I had a couple of police officers there and we started discussing this concealed carry bill and the police officer brought up a concern about how do we keep guns out of you know the, the hands of people that really we don't want them to have guns and um, we found that, at least in the legislation that was being proposed, we found this this loophole where bad people could fall through. And, and I know I'm not being very specific about it, but what we did was we created sort of a stopgap catch-all. Um, basically what it did was it said that if you are a person who is without criminal conviction and without uh, serious mental illness or addiction problems, you would be eligible for this license. However, it didn't address people who had been arrested multiple times, never uh, convicted. And so we thought, well, how do we do this? You can't deny uh, the license to someone who's been arrested. But we created an objection process where if you are arrested five or more times in the last seven years or three or more times for gang-related offenses, there would be an automatic objection to you receiving a license and you would go to a hearing. So really what we did was we sort of created this uh, hybrid bill where the law-abiding citizen is able to exercise his rights, but those that we're worried about, we have an opportunity to 
have a hearing to ensure that they make good decisions before we grant them this license. So at least have a waiting period be, to, for that to happen. And, and a hearing process. And a hearing process. Right. And that came out of a community. Came hearing. out of a community of, meeting. You're listening yes. to, the, your, to your constituents. It, it came from a constituent in my office. I always like to say I got to, I, I had the good fortune of being able to propose the legislation, which, by the way, got more votes than any other provision in the concealed carry bill. Um, but it was my constituent who came to my meeting and took the moment to be involved in the process who created the law. Raise the issues. Right. That, uh, important. Uh, and we have another caller Excellent. who would like to uh, ask a question. Caller, welcome, and please ask your question. I guess I want to make a couple of points, if I might. I, I do agree with the representative in terms of um, we did not adequately meet the obligations that were established with regard to pensions in the state of Illinois over the years. However, at the same time, I would argue uh, that the amounts that were negotiated were a function of political needs on the part of people who voted those amounts in. In other words, you know, we're willing to provide Union X with this age of uh, retirement, with these benefits, and that we're very generous in many cases, such that even if we had funded them to the degree that we should have uh, uh, yearly, that it would still would have been something that we would be hard. It would be hard to meet those obligations because, frankly, they were overfunded because somebody decided to make a deal for a vote 25 years ago. Not uh, you know, not expecting that you know, kicking the can down the road, as it were, politically. At some time, the people of the state of Illinois were going to have to meet that obligation, one that wasn't realistic, to be quite frank. Um. It's a good observation, and, and I would say that uh, there's probably some tr truth to it. Um, uh, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit uh, in the sense that, and only because when I was down there in this last eight months, uh, I met with each and every one of the administrators of the pensions, and they said that had the payments been made timely and as required, there would be, we would be 100% funded. There would be no issue of, of uh, unfunded liability. And, and so there's no, the, 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 the retirement, uh, the, the benefits that were promised would, would not be a burden on the system. Um, and, and that's not my assessment. That's what I was told by these nonpartisan uh, pension administrators. So, you know, the, there is a couple of fallacies. Number one, we have to remember that the, the benefits that public employees get are not as rich as most people think they are. They're not entitled to Social Security, most of the vast majority of state employees. So the pension is the only form of retirement savings that they have. Uh, secondly, the average state pension, and this shocks people when they hear it, state employees of the five systems is $37,000 a year. So we're not talking about people being really enriched in their retirement. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's when we make these changes, I think it's very important, whatever plan we come up with, the conference committee comes up with, I think it's very important that we're mindful of the fact that it's our goal as a country, as a state and as citizens, that people should have secure retirements. And so we want to make sure that whatever changes we make to the system, that we're still providing a secure retirement. One of the things I said I will not vote for is a benefit schedule that actually punishes people as they live longer and longer into retirement, giving them less and less effective purchasing power every year. To me, that's just inherently wrong. And, and you know, that'll be something that I think about when we get to the bill. Great. Wonderful. And we have another caller. Caller, welcome. Please ask your question. Yes, good evening, Representative Marwick. Good evening. I have a question for you. Next school year, Illinois is lowering the required age that a student must attend school from seven years old to six. Now, proponents say that the early start is advantageous to students, while opponents say this shouldn't be a state decision but a parent's decision. What are your thoughts? Well, um, I'm. Uh, it's it's an it's an interesting issue. I've I've, I've certainly uh, listened to both sides of it. Um, I personally, I'm a fan of early education. Um, I think that we should provide opportunities for education at a much earlier age than six. I was shocked that it was seven. Um, personally, I started my education when I was two. I started school at two at an early education program. And I've met with a number of groups that show the benefits of early uh, childhood education and the positive effects that they pay down the road. Um, I don't think getting kids into school at six is too early. I think it's really, uh, I, I think it's a good thing. I'm, I'm a fan of it. I, I'm pretty sure I voted for it. Um, and uh, it, it is, I think it's a good idea. So 
I, I guess that answers the question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, caller. Thank you. And you're watching Political Forum. This is community service of CAN TV. It's a live interactive service, so please call in. Uh, 312-738-1060. I'm Jane Ramsey, a board member of CAN TV. Um, Representative Martwick, uh, fracking has been um, a hot issue all over the country, uh, and it's certainly been an issue here in Illinois. Um, what's the what are the issues with fracking, and where are you on the issue? Well, um, so we passed a comprehensive. Uh, fracking regulation bill in the last legislature and I like to say that I'm an armchair environmentalist which means I know I want to be environmentally friendly and I know I want to be green but I'm not always so sure since I'm not an expert how to do that so when I want to know how to be green I rely on the groups that have an established track record in being green the Sierra Club, the Illinois Environmental Council, uh, the in Illinois Environmental Law and Policy Center. Um, these groups really know what it means to be green and to be environmentally friendly, and they advocate for it heartily. Um, when I came down, I thought for sure they would be against the idea of fracking. And while they would prefer that we not frack, um, what they said was that in Illinois, fracking was already permissible, but it was unregulated. And so they had met with the companies that were seeking to do the fracking, were seeking for an expansion of the rights, and they negotiated the most strict and comprehensive regulations of fracking of any state in the country. And so in the end, the environmental groups were urging a yes on the fracking regulations. And so um, to me, it was pretty fascinating. Um, we have more disclosure required than any other state about the chemicals that are going in, what's being happened. We have more safeguards to the, the process and we have the ability if some of these environmental studies come out and they, dis they, they, they disclose something to us that, that makes us want to change those regulations, we have the ability to go in and change them and, and tighten them up a little bit. So I think it was a good bill. Uh, hopefully it will provide some economic benefit to Illinois and at, at the uh, uh, advice of the, the environmentalists, we'll do it in an environmentally friendly fashion. That that was a surprise to you and something that you learned as the new state rep. Oh, I learned quite yeah. a bit, yes. Um, we just have a few minutes left. Anything that we've left unturned that you uh, would could share with us? You know, I, the only thing that I would say is um, to everyone who's listening, if you've enjoyed the discussion and if you've enjoyed uh, the issues, uh, get, get involved. Um, I, I tell people all the time we live in the greatest country in the world because every two years mm -hmm. we get a revolution. It's called Election Day. And um, I've had a number of citizens come and get involved with me, meet me, talk about issues. And uh, we have a citizen legislature. I'm not supposed to be an expert on everything. So when I talk to uh, to, re uh, to constituents, they come up with ideas that, that help me formulate ideas uh, that we can turn into laws that help improve the state. So get involved, be a part of the process. It's really fascinating. That's, that's a perfect way to end. Um, Representative Martwick, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. This is uh, Political Forum, service of CAN TV. We've been helped this evening by Steve, our uh, telephone um, technician. And we uh, urge you to join us again next Wednesday for Political Forum. Good night.